Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the Keto Answers Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Anthony Gustin, and this week joining me is Dr. Jeff Volek. If you don't know of this guy's name, you do not do much keto research. He has been the author on over 300 research articles, 200 lectures, five plus books. He's just one of the first people in the space. Him and Dr. Stephen Finney are the ones who kind of have pioneered the keto movement. I mean, it was like 10 years ago or so. They started with the art and science of low carbohydrate living a book, and then also the art and science of low carbohydrate performance. And with that, I mean, they were just years and years and years ahead of the game and have pushed all of the research forward. They are now doing a lot of crazy stuff. So whether that's research in finding out where the, the benefits are to move forward in a ketogenic diet or using Verda Health, which is a company trying to get reversal of 100 million people from diabetes and the work is just non-stop. So it was a great conversation with Dr. Volok about everything that he's learned in the last 10, 20, 30 years. I mean, this is literally one of the most knowledgeable people on a ketogenic diet. So couldn't thank him enough for being on the show and taking his time out of his busy schedule. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Dr. Jeff Volek. But before we get started, I want to let you guys in on a little secret. <laughs> and that is that we have some brand new keto bar flavors. And so the same thing that we had with the almond butter brownie that you guys loved and went crazy about, and we sold out in five days when we released that one, we have lemon poppy seed and salted caramel. So these two are just ridiculous. The lemon poppy seed tastes exactly like a frosted lemon poppy seed muffin or cake or whatever you buy at Starbucks that is delicious, but it kills you, so don't buy those things. Um, and then also salted caramel, which tastes pretty much like it says. So salted caramel. So these things are great you know, on the go, as a treat, whatever. Same standards we have with the other bar. So we tested blood sugar with this. Um, no blood sugar spike. No effect in ketone levels. Actually increased a couple of team members' ketone levels. And yeah, I mean, otherwise the exact same. We actually bumped the collagen from 10 to 11 just because, you know, 10 grams is enough. So we had to go 11. <laughs> otherwise, these things are amazing. So if you want to try them out before they go to stock, which may happen very, very soon, we just launched them at perfectketo.com and use the code new keto bars to get 20% off your order this whole month. So go stock up now. And if you already have, um, then go grab your favorite flavor. Mine is the lemon poppy seed. Unwrap that little sucker and enjoy it for the show. Dr. Jeff Folick, thank you for being on the show today. My pleasure. Great to be here, Anthony. You are a busy man, I think. <laughs> and so I really appreciate you taking the time to come on today. So for the few people who may not know of you, do um, you want to just give me a quick background of your extensive work history? I mean, I think that the, when I was looking through and preparing something like 300 uh, scientific research journals, 200 lectures, five books many, many decades of work in this field. So if you just maybe give people a short background. Yeah, I, uh, I stumbled into this area. Oh boy, it's um, it's going on 25 years ago or so in the early 90s uh, as a budding graduate student um, who wasn't convinced what I was being taught by my professors was exactly correct. And uh, and that's been a, a, an interesting rabbit hole to go down. Uh, I published my first studies in the in the early 2000, but I started doing experiments in the mid 90s, and um, and it's been quite a journey. So it's been really two, you know, two decades of of research in this area and seen some highs and lows um, in terms of the you know acceptance and and and, and a general attention um uh, on the diets but i have to say um you know the last couple of years in particular have been quite refreshing just in terms of the uh volume of science and and overall interest in ketogenic diets yeah i mean i have a uh, it's a google scholar alert set and it seems like every single day now i'm getting some new stuff come across the my email inbox where I was a couple of years ago I was maybe once a week I was getting something so yeah I mean the, the pace has just been astronomical as of lately when you started going is that you were just interested in a, in physical performance or what were those things that your professors were telling you that you maybe weren't weren't on board with and needed to solve for yourself well I was uh, I started out in dietetics uh, and became a registered dietitian and so I had the classic training which unfortunately really hasn't changed much today. So, you know, everything was about low fat, um, uh, high carb, you know, lots of grains and et cetera. Um, but then I went on to graduate school and exercise physiology because I was interested in sport nutrition and exercise metabolism. And, uh, you know, but it was right, it was right at the time of entering into 
you know, graduate school as a master's student when I really started to challenge some of the ideas of, you know, especially managing diabetics. I mean, we were taught as dietitians that we, w- we needed to feed, you know, anyone with type 2 diabetes over half their calories from carbs. And, you know, I wasn't quite smart enough um, to understand why that didn't make sense. I thought I just didn't quite get it. Um, but it just didn't make sense to me. And, you know, the more I studied it, the more I, I was right. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, but it really inspired me um, to want to study metabolism on a deeper level and understand this. And the more I got into it, uh, uh, and a lot of it was self um, teaching and, and reading a lot of articles, um, the more I realized um, a lot of what we think we know is, is actually incorrect. And, you know, and, and professors were um, were not really um, advocating low carb, so they were confirming the status quo, which is athletes need carbs. And so, uh, was, was that just fueling uh, strategies that the fueling strategies were incorrect, or I mean, what was the, what was the main problem that you had with it at that point, the status quo? Well, there's no doubt the uh, you know both in general nutrition as well as sport nutrition, there's an emphasis on high carbohydrate diets as being healthy, especially in, in for athletes where you have, um, you know, coming out of the sixties with a lot of this work in Scandinavia with, uh, uh, glycogen being discovered and the relationship between high carb diets and high glycogen as being obligate for, um, you know, high performance. And, um, and that really led to carbohydrate loading. So you have this carb supremacy paradigm that's, been going on now for 40 or 50 years and it's more or less the you know the more carbs the better you know fuel before during after exercise and we're seeing now that that um, doesn't work well for a lot of people Uh, and you know we can get into this more but you have a lot of athletes um, really struggling with this type of approach and when they you know really abandon their carb loading and focus more on protein and fat and limit the carbs, um, it's nothing short of transformative for a lot of these folks. So, you know, you know nutrition is very complicated. There's no silver bullets, but I think this mindset of as, you know, pumping as much carbs as possible is not correct. Um, I, would, I would argue it's consume as few carbs as possible while maintaining optimal performance is a better strategy. And that doesn't necessarily mean ketogenic or even very low carb for some athletes, but it's a it's a mind shift. It's a different paradigm of instead of maximizing carbohydrate intake, you're you're really focused on minimizing it while trying to optimize performance. Right. And that could be different for um, different athletes. It can even be different within a person depending on their goals and and uh, life um, sort of status. Um, if the as you age, you tend to get more carb intolerant, and and so your needs can change over time and in response to um, different events in your life. So this this is something that um, uh, unfortunately is is very complicated. There's no simple answers here, but uh, I think we've overemphasized carbs in general and and ignored low carb as an option for athletes and 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 non athletes. And so was this the, the first vertical you kind of dove into? Was this performance in, in regards to carbohydrate consumption? Well, actually, I, uh, I always, I would say that's what, you know, really started my interest in wanting to even go to graduate school and become a, well, I was going to always lead it after a master's, um, but I, I really fell in love with research and uh, the decision was pretty easy to stick around another four or five years and get a PhD. But um, uh, I, I, uh, I became quite interested in um, fat metabolism and cholesterol and lipoprotein metabolism because a lot of the um, current dietary guidelines are based primarily on the diet heart hypothesis, which you know was Ansel Keys and this I guess really primarily the 60s and 70s that really um, this this theory was promoted and is still in many ways um, promoted today. But that was all based on the idea that overconsumption of fat, specifically saturated fat, raised cholesterol, and that in turn increased risk for heart disease. So, um, you know, I really initially kind of got focused on studying how nutrition 
how low carb diets affected cholesterol metabolism and that's that's been a continuous interest of mine. We're still doing studies in that area because it's just fascinating. Yeah, and if we were actually to pause that for a second, I mean, I think a lot of people have heard now in the keto space this term of lean mass hyperresponder. How, how would you be able to break that down in a digestible format for people who have who haven't really understood a lot of the science? Yeah, well, the I, I think just to take a step back, if you look at how ketogenic diets affect cholesterol metabolism, in general, you have a very uniform response in terms of triglycerides go down quite consistently and that's good hdl cholesterol good cholesterol goes up uh in most people and um ldl cholesterol however which is you know the one physicians focus on and want to prescribe a statin if that goes up um that is quite variable um in terms of cholesterol ldl cholesterol concentration and we've done you know dozens of studies including highly controlled feeding studies with precision controlled meals. And, you know, uh, you take a hundred people, feed them the exact same food for, uh, you know, a month, measure their cholesterol under the most well-controlled conditions. And what you'll find is half the people, their LDL cholesterol goes up, the other half, they go down. Some people, it goes up quite remarkably. It might maybe 50 points. And then, and then another person it goes down 50 points. And, uh, and so um, if you dig a little deeper, you know, now we have really good evidence that LDL cholesterol is not just a single uh, type of particle. It's, it's, it, it, there's small particles, large particles. They have different composition. And there's very good evidence now, uh, although I will admit this is controversial. Uh, but um, if you look at the evidence now, it's pretty clear. It's the small, dense LDL particles that are most atherogenic and confer uh, the most risk for cardiovascular disease. And and it's tied to triglyceride levels. So it's no surprise on a ketogenic diet, you see consistently the small atherogenic particles go down. And that's independent of whether or not you are a hyper responder in terms of your LDL cholesterol. Um, so that's just kind of, you know, then, so you get into this paradigm of, do you believe it's the total cholesterol that matters or the LDL cholesterol concentration or do you b believe more in the triglycerides, HDL, small LDL particles are the ones that are most important? And, to, you know, the simple answer is nobody knows for sure, uh, but keto, uh, ketogenic diets definitely improve one and low-fat diets are definitely better at lowering LDL cholesterol. So you have uh, sort of conflicting uh, paradigms here. Uh, but, you know, the idea of hyper responders, so there seems to be, and this is kind of a, uh, you know, a new area, there's only a few studies, um, a lot of anecdotal testimonial data out there, but it seems that if you add uh, exercise, especially high volume endurance exercise to a ketogenic diet, a greater percentage of people um, manifest in a hypercholesterolemic response. So in other words, if you're an endurance athlete, you want a ketogenic diet, there's a much better chance you end up being one of these hyper responders. And so um, we don't know exactly what accounts for that, um, whether there's just some inherent genetic uh, propensity that successful endurance athletes have or whether there's truly an interaction between Exercise. I suspect it could be a little bit of both, but probably the latter, simply because, especially in these ultra endurance athletes that are very um, successful and well trained, that uh, they are prodigious fat burners. Right. And a function of cholesterol is to transport fat around the body through the bloodstream. And if you need to move fat around uh, at a greater rate and more efficiently, it makes sense that you would expand your cholesterol pool. Uh, it's not that it's atherogenic. Um, you just need more lipid-carrying vehicles uh, to move fat to the muscle and other um, tissues and organs that are using a lot of fat. And we know the keto-adapted athlete, and really the, anybody who's keto-adapted, doubles their rate of fat burning. Uh, but especially in these endurance athletes where you see um, extremely high – rates of fat oxidation. So we think it's a functional um, uh, adaptation that actually serves a purpose right. and, and is more beneficial. So, more so that it's a state of flux and things are moving around more. And I think that we can confuse that with 
lot of clinical assumptions, which is that higher of whatever cholesterol, that means bad and, and you need to go on a statin because you're unhealthy. Whereas if someone's, you know, it's sedentary lifestyle and they're not moving and they're eating a bunch of terrible food, that, that you know, maybe that correlation does make a little bit more sense. But if, you know, every other marker we see, inflammation is low, oxidative stress is low, oxidized LDL is low, small particle count is low, things like that, I think, we, you know, we can just come up with a with an updated model on this like I think you guys are doing. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. All the other biomarkers, um, pretty much anything you can think of measuring improves. Uh, so it's a, it's a very isolated increase in LDL. And, you know, this gets into the whole controversy around cholesterol as a risk factor, which, you know, that's a, a highly beloved belief by physicians and most healthcare professionals. But the reality is, and I don't want to totally dismiss it, but it's, I think it's fair and accurate to say that it's been overstated how important cholesterol levels are. And a lot of that's been driven by drug companies. Right as we have very effective drugs that can decrease cholesterol. So I think they've, let's just say, influenced the narrative a bit on that. If you really look deep into the evidence, the relationship between cholesterol levels and heart attack and heart disease are not particularly strong. And, uh, you know, cholesterol is fine if it's circulating in the blood. It's only when it penetrates the arteries and contributes to atherosclerosis, which is really more of an inflammatory um, mechanism than a cholesterol mechanism right. uh, so we, you published one of the first books on kind of i would say ketogenic diet the, the modern form of ketogenic diet art and science of low carbohydrate living and then kind of immediately after that or very soon after that the same thing the art and science of low carbohydrate performance and those are i mean what eight eight ten ish years ago now yeah it's, it's hard to believe but I, I believe yeah we're approaching a decade so it's time to update <laughs> yeah it is what so that's one of the things i wanted to touch with you on is what are the things that you would update if you were to go back in really second versions of each of these you know generalized keto i would say or low carbohydrate leaving and then as well as performance what are the things that we know now that we didn't back then well a couple of things uh, probably the most um obvious new newer uh area of, of ketone research is um the now um, recognition that beta-hydroxybutyrate, the principal uh, circulating ketone, is a, is a potent signaling molecule. So it's acting like a hormone, and this is in addition to its you know well-documented uh, role as an alternative fuel. Uh, so now it's 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 even um, you know more pleiotropic in terms of how we look at ketogenic diets and how they're functioning it's you know it, it, it's 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 really hard to pin down a specific mechanism because it works through a lot of different uh, pathways and and now we have a whole bunch more uh you know for example uh we know that beta hydroxybutyrate is a potent uh, hdac inhibitor histone deacetylase inhibitor which affects gene expression and upregulates antioxidant defense uh, it also decreases inflammation through the NLRP3 inflammasome. And so these are direct signaling effects of ketones. You know, they happen to explain a lot of the clinical outcomes that, you know, we had documented in many previous studies, but now we actually understand mechanism a bit more. Uh, so this has really interested a lot of the basic scientists now uh, wanting to now look at various ways of inducing ketosis and you know for example looking at longevity you've got a lot of uh, interest now in that area because of these um, signaling effects of ketones so that's one we really didn't touch on that much at all in the books and that's really because um, that work um, kind of started about seven or eight years ago and there's been a lot of a lot of um, subsequent publications supporting that and so with that maybe lend a hand to people who supplement with ketones either with salts or with esters or i mean what is your viewpoint on the signaling molecule aspect obviously yes it can uh, uh, allow yourself to have a an alternative fuel or an addition to fuel especially when you're becoming keto adapted but with the role of ketogenic supplements i mean is there a possibility that they are providing a lot of signaling benefits or, or what is your view on that yeah well it's possible um but this is a whole new area, too, and, and we're really in an embryonic stage in understanding how these exogenous ketone um, and different forms affect physiology and whether or not they mimic 
or recapitulate the human um, response to a ketogenic diet. Uh, it's a big area of interest for me, but again, we, we don't. Well, there's so many more questions than answers, um, and we've been trying to move this field forward. Um, but what you have to realize is there's, there's going to be differences for sure. Uh, that's almost guaranteed. But the question more is, are there some similarities? Because a ketogenic diet, some of the benefits are attributed to ketones. But many of the benefits are more related to the restriction in carbohydrate, the lower insulin stimulation and signaling, and some of the downstream uh, responses to that. And you're not going to get most of those benefits, such as enhanced fat oxidation, um, just by taking exogenous ketones and consuming carbs along with it. So I have an open mind. I, 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 uh, I think um, these, these, these new um, supplements need to be investigated, but um, it'd be premature to say you could just replace the ketogenic diet with exogenous right. ketones and keep eating all the carbs you want. Um, but I do think there's probably going to turn out to be some important applications of the exogenous ketones, maybe even as an adjunct to the ketogenic diet or as a sort of lead into a ketogenic diet for people that may struggle with getting into ketosis. Uh, uh, there's many, many um, questions um, and potential applications, uh, just a lot to sort out though yet. And, and there's likely differences between the different types of exogenous ketones, whether it's ester or salt and what minerals are attached to the salts and so forth. So um, mechanism is, is one of the main things you guys would have included. What about um, second and third? big big things that you know now that we didn't know before well just just the the um volume of of, of research out there i mean in almost every area of, um i mean we had good evidence that uh, diabetes was highly amendable to ketogenic diets but we have even stronger evidence so we would just update some of the literature bases um but uh you know when we wrote the books there was not a lot of interest uh in cancer and some of the uh, uh, different neurological conditions outside of epilepsy, like uh, Alzheimer's, for example. Um, there's some really um, strong preclinical data now um, for those um, targets that I think are worth writing about. Now, we still have a lot of questions because we don't have large randomized clinical trials, but um, I'd a lot of that work is underway, and um, the preclinical data in animal studies and smaller human studies and case studies all look very promising. And just mechanistically and metabolically, the, the theories are pretty strong. So um, it's really exciting times um, while we wait for some of this work to get done. So there's, there would be areas to update around um, sort of other uh, clinical targets beyond obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, which are you know, pretty tightly linked to the insulin resistant phenotype. And, and as far as a performance edge goes, I mean, that was one of your, I think, still uh, a huge driving factor of the research you do. But I mean, what are the big things that we know now? Is it, is it adaptation periods? Is it, you know, electrolyte needs? Like, what are the, what are the big things that maybe you're like, oh, duh, now that it's 2019 and we know this, I should have put that in there before? Well, that, that, that area of, um, performance, which is kind of a broad term, but, um, uh, you know, in terms of enhancing physical performance and even men mental cognitive abilities, um, it's moved forward slowly. So we could certainly update what we wrote. I think we were pretty right on with what we wrote. There's been a few studies published that confirm um, a, a lot of what we wrote, but, but that area moves really slow um, in part because it's really hard to get funding in general, to study ketogenic diets in any area, um, but it's especially difficult, you know, in the area of sport performance or athletic performance, just because it's not something the mainstream sponsors like NIH would um, would even consider. So it's it's a really hard area to move forward because of limitations in, in funding, um, but. Um, but there have been, you know, uh, a few studies here and there published over the last few years that uh, that show um, positive effects of ketogenic diets. 
And if you had unlimited money to study some of these things, like what are the top few pressing issues that you think would unlock the next wave of research? Well, well, um, you know, we're really focused here at OSU in two main areas or thrust. Um, one is the performance side of it, and that is really more on the military applications. So uh, how can we enhance soldier health, uh, readiness, uh, resilience? Uh, so we think of that very broadly um, in terms of just enhancing the human condition or optimizing human abilities. And for the soldier, that can take on a lot of different uh, aspects, but that crosses over into you know athletes as well, because th- at the end of the day, these soldiers uh, need to perform just like athletes do. Uh, and also, you know, because funding-wise, um, we have opportunities to go to Department of Defense or DARPA uh, and so forth. Um, if we take that route. Um, so that's one big focus, um, but it's pretty broad because we're looking at everything from, uh, you know, how ketosis might enhance physical performance to cognitive abilities to protection from concussions uh, and enhancing uh, recovery, uh, et cetera. The other big areas uh, that we're focused on here at OSU is cancer, um, and, and I think that's one of the next frontiers Um, because as I said the the data are very promising now but we really need better human studies and so we have uh, one ongoing trial now it's still a relatively small study but compared to what's been published it's the largest human trial right now and that's in women with stage four metastatic breast cancer and I can't talk too much about that but I will say um uh, it's feasible, and, and the women accept the diet, no problem, and they, they get into nutritional ketosis, and um, the early results look very promising. And these are women in, that you know are, are really sick. Um, the, uh, um, the prognosis is, is pretty poor with the, this kind of diagnosis, and uh, you know, and, and treatment's more or less palliative at that point. So, um, so we're very excited about that project, but we're, we've got a lot of other projects in the pipeline to to look at everything from combining the ketogenic diet with different um, uh, drugs that um, could be synergistic with the ketogenic diet and and also looking in different types of cancer. Um, So there's a, I think that's going to be a really exciting area over the next several years and decades, really, because there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And so is that replacing some sort of standards of care or is it as an adjunct to to therapy or like, how do you imagine a best case scenario shaking out? Is, is That's a great control. question. And um, in most cases, I think most people are viewing ke- ketogenic diets as an adjunct to uh, other therapies. Um, so if you're getting radiation therapy or chemotherapy or even immunotherapy, um, you know, the, it, 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 it's hypothesized in most cases that the ketogenic diet would enhance or synergize with those other treatment paradigms. Uh, as far as bringing it back to your your focus on military personnel, you said a study published the last month, um, Munich group people. Do you want to just maybe walk through findings there and maybe highlight highlight what you guys got out of that research? Sure. Um, well, this is uh, kind of a, 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 a pilot study in many ways, you know, because we wanted to establish. Um, with the military that we could even recruit a, a group of military personnel and get them to accept the diet and, and get them into ketosis because that's one of their biggest concerns, to be quite frank. They um, they don't think that they don't want to change, you know, it's too much work to change the diet of the soldiers. So um, so we um, recruited a group of, uh, of people into this study that are part of the Ohio State uh, Army, Army ROTC, were, the, most of them were from Army, we had a few others. Uh, so these were um, relatively young, I think a mean age of about 25, uh, though a few uh, up in the uh, 30s and, and early 40s. Uh, and the idea was just to, to see if they would accept the diet, but we also um, did a lot of uh, measurements too. So it was a 12-week intervention, and we recruited 15 uh, uh, people into the ketogenic group and another 15 into a low-fat uh, sort of standard American diet group 
and tracked them for 12 weeks, trained them, uh, and took them through a whole battery of tests, uh, including everything from muscle biopsies and resting metabolic rate and cognitive tests and uh, body composition and so forth. And we published the first paper. We have other papers uh, we're working on now, but the first paper was really focused on the body composition. Well, it's focused on the feasibility part, um, which it was feasible. Uh, it was very um, uh, it was very well received. Uh, and that was just due to compliance, or what was the measurement that you were looking at for feasibility? We were actually measuring ketones uh, every day. Um, we'd have them you know, do a finger stick and measure beta hydroxybutyrate and have them report that back to us every day. And that really served two purposes. One, it's a measure of compliance, um, but it also is a way for us to individualize the diet because everyone's a little different and needs to restrict carbs and um, moderate protein um, uh, to a different extent to be in ketosis. So we got everybody above one millimolar, which is quite impressive um, huh. in these sort of uh, you know outpatient studies. Uh, so everyone was in ketosis. Um, and it was not a weight loss study, so we did not prescribe calories. We wanted that to be one of the outcomes. It was a dependent variable. But uh, it was quite a uh, robust effect on weight loss. Every single person lost weight. The mean weight loss was, um, all, I think, a little over 15 pounds. And it was um, almost uh, all fat loss. Um, and this was really the first study to uh, measure visceral fat. So the fat that surrounds your organs, which is much more highly associated with cardiometabolic disease. And we did that with a preferred, um, you know, advanced imaging method using MRI. And, uh, and so um, the ketogenic diet significantly reduced visceral fat as well. And it did not negatively impact um, or positively impact in, in relative to the high carb group adaptations to training. So they got stronger and adapted to the training in the same way that the high carb group did, um, which is um, positive in our mind. Um, and a lot of that was focused on strength and power, less on endurance. So that was kind of another novel aspect because that's a, kind of a question out there of whether or not being keto adapted would negatively impact strength and power. And, and in this case, it did not. Um, so, um, we had, uh, you know, a wide range of performance parameters that we looked at. Did you see any initial dip off then kind of a rebalancing? Cause this is about 12 weeks, right? Uh, actually, you know, we did look at that and, um, we expected it, but it wasn't as profound as we, we thought. Um, and I'm not sh sure why, cause there usually is a, um, is a drop off, but maybe that's more specific to the endurance, um, community where, you know, you really need to give it a good three to four weeks before you start feeling back to normal and uh, that really wasn't the case too much but we were very careful to implement a well formulated ketogenic diet so it had adequate sodium and people weren't volume depleted um, which can happen if you're not aware of the naturesis of ketosis and so forth so that may have contributed some but it was there wasn't a you know a real um, drop off as, as we thought there might be so the physical adaptation was the exact same pretty much or, or similar. The physical health markers were all positive outcomes. So we had uh, high rates of fat oxidation, um, a lot of visceral fat loss, improvements in body composition. And did you guys track, I mean, this, I, I just feel like this would be a very important thing to look at for military application, but any sort of subjective or objective mental markers as far as mental health goes, focus, concentration, energy levels, anything like that? Yeah, we did a whole um, battery of cognitive tests, and we haven't uh, presented that yet. And we haven't, to be honest, haven't analyzed it yet either, so I, I can't speak to that right now. And we did a lot of surveys and things. And, and overall, yeah, we, I mean, there were, there were a few subjects that struggled a little bit. Um, but overall, um, there, were, there were some um, amazing uh, transformations in terms of body composition in a few subjects, and they provided some very powerful testimonials for us. Uh, so it had overall a very positive effect. Uh, but at least for that first study, and, and arguably the, the, the primary goal of the study was um, – to really address the obesity problem in the military um, because, you know, it, it's, it's, it's frightening, um, but 
in three fourths of soldiers uh, right now are either overweight or obese. Wow. And um, close to s- around 70% of youth, uh, 17 to 23, are ineligible for the military, primarily because of obesity. And this has been described as a national security crisis because we may have trouble filling a military, not because people don't want to join, but because they don't meet the criteria. So um, so we really uh, kind of played up that angle more than anything in this initial paper. But we have some other data, um, too, that was a little more um, mechanistic um, from muscle biopsies, looking at glycogen and mitochondrial functioning and so forth that, that's pretty provocative, um, all very positive. Uh, so there were a lot of other questions we were trying to address in this study, too, that will likely get out um, this later this year. Yeah, it, what's interesting to me is, I mean, I wonder if that, I mean, has there been any look as if that's before they're entering the military or if it's after they get into the military, either high amount of stress or poor nutrition is leading to these things? I mean, have you looked into that at all? Well, I think, you know, it's not been... um, well documented, but but I, you see definite um, trends that kind of mimic the general population. Um, and if you look on these bases and what food is provided, uh, it's it's very much modeled after the dietary guidelines. So there's a lot of high carbohydrate and you know actually a lot of sugar available to these soldiers. And um, yeah, and at, that, it's not too surprising. At, at GoArmy.com, the literal army website, it says a, an MRE. M- MRE, which is a meal ready to eat, so like a, a when in combat, what what soldiers can have access to and eat, and it says contains the following items: entree, spaghetti, side dish, rice, corn, fruit, or mashed potatoes, cracker or bread, spread, peanut butter, jelly, or cheese spread, dessert, cookies or pound cakes, candy, M and M's, Skittles, Tootsie Rolls, beverages, Gatorade like mixes, cocoa, dairy shakes, and hot sauce. <laughs> so the- it's yeah. I mean, this is what we're fueling our top soldiers with i mean it's it's sad right i mean i have to think that almost and you like you said that this is potentially like a, a pilot study to dig in a little bit deeper and, and feel figure out where we can go but i have to imagine that keto friendly mres would would not only reverse the obesity problem but but also i mean just thinking about me personally being able to eat one meal a day really easily on a ketogenic diet versus i'm always hungry three, four, five meals a day if I'm not. Um, I mean, just that if you're in combat and, and super stressed and then you're looking at things like it be BHB be able to act as a signaling molecule to decrease anxiety, to, to improve recovering and, and things like that. I think that it, obviously we have a lot of hypotheses why that would make a lot of sense. Absolutely. I mean, you just named off um, a whole bunch of things we're trying to study uh, because, you know, Keto adapting a person profoundly changes every cell in the body. I mean, in terms of the fuels it's using, the gene expression, uh, and and in that regard, I mean, it, it it can affect just about every performance parameter and health marker. Uh, we think in in a positive way, um, based on a lot of the work done in clinical populations. Uh, but um, there's a lot of work to do to translate this to the soldier and also kind of bust through the bureaucracy in the, in the military, in the Department of Defense. Um, it's, it's hard to move fast there. So this has been a long sort of uh, effort to get them comfortable with ketones and ketogenic diets. Um, they are very interested in the exogenous ketones. Um, I think it's more palatable uh, for them to think about providing that versus changing diet. So they are funding quite a bit of research in that area, uh, which is, I think, positive uh, because it's like a foot in the door to maybe uh, convincing them that the ketogenic diet would have even more application. But having said that, I I have gotten a lot of grants rejected. But I'm not quitting. So, uh, you know, there, there is a lot of grassroots um, support for it. If you talk to a lot of soldiers at bases, they're, they're doing this. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's got to be met with some top-down support as well, and we're not quite there yet. Right. Well, thanks for doing the work, You're doing all the hard work for everybody. Um, as far as, like you said before, you would have added more data around type 2 diabetes. And so... If people don't know about Verda Health and what you're doing there, maybe just a, a quick overview of the, the work that's going on there. 
Yeah, uh, yes. So uh, Verta Health is uh, a company that I co-founded with Steve Finney, who is my co-author on the books as well and, and good friend and collaborator on researches too. Um, and then um, Sami Inkin, our current CEO, is the other um, co-founder. Uh, so uh, it, what we've founded was a company that's really focused on reversing type 2 diabetes at scale. Uh, our mission is to reverse diabetes in 100 million people by 2025. Uh, I think that might have been extended to 2027 now, but uh, we are making very good progress. Our, our initial focus was just to prove we could do this. Uh, and so we started a clinical trial a couple of years ago, and we've published one-year data now, and um, our two-year data was just accepted, so it'll be published soon. Uh, as a 400 or so um, patients with type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes that we um, enrolled into our program, which at its core is a ketogenic diet, but we've combined that with a virtual care model, which essentially means... Um, we educate people on the ketogenic diet through an app and provide them with a health, access to a health coach pretty much 24 hours a day, as well as a physician that um, is really key to all this um, because of the need to adjust medications uh, from a safety standpoint. Um, and so we've basically built the infrastructure to practice telemedicine um, uh, from scratch. Uh, so it's a San Francisco-based company, and we've published data now. And we're working with several um, uh, contractors to, um, to implement our program in their um, in their companies, and even um, now talking with insurance plans. Uh, and the results are quite extraordinary. Uh, in our clinical trial, uh, we are able to reverse diabetes in approximately half of the patients that. Um, were enrolled, and that is while um, we're getting them off medications so that we're getting most patients um, either off insulin or significantly reducing the dosage off sulfonylureas and other um, diabetes and blood pressure medications, and they're losing significant amounts of weight, even though that's not a focus of our program, but uh, um, they um, they lose significant amounts of weight, and they've been able to um, maintain that out to two years now. Uh, so um, the, uh, you know, the company is thriving really in many ways and, and, and very much focused on scaling um, and being able to deliver this to as many people as possible. And unfortunately, there are hundreds of millions of people across the planet um, that need help and they're really not getting it. Right. And, and so how does that work as far as the protocol is concerned? Do you, do you guys have a blanket recommendation, you say, okay, eat this amount of macros and whatever food you want. Do you personalize it to the person? Do you give them food choices? I mean, what is, well, it's very individualized. So, uh, you know, we have the app and, um, the health coaches, um, you know, basically individualize the curriculum that we've developed, um, for each patient. And we also collect biomarkers to help personalize it. And, uh, and that, is all being integrated then, and and so there's a lot of machine learning, artificial intelligence built into everything that we do. Uh, so the more people we treat, the better we get, uh, and the more automated we can become, which is really necessary to scale to the numbers that we want to. So, it, so it's kind of a custom onboarding flow. Is that a, they take a quiz, they work with somebody, and and generally. We'll, I mean, I guess, like you did with the study, are you tracking millimolar serum concentration of BHB? Or, I mean, how are the ways that you're ensuring that they are complying? Yeah, that's that's part of it is um, is measuring ketones. So we provide everybody with a meter and, and strips and uh, record their values. And that's one way to individualize it and kind of monitor them. We monitor their weight as well. Uh, so... Um, Right now, those uh, are really kind of the two primary biomarkers we're tracking. Uh, and, um, you know, as far as the education they're getting, it's it's a variety of different uh, sort of, um, modalities of, of information from everything from, you know, video recordings to um, um, uh, online um, sort of support group that uh, – because that's the one thing you sort of miss um, – when you're doing this through an app, um, you can individualize 
the intensity and the content um, to a great extent, but you lose the group support. So we have developed support groups that people can uh, engage with other people going through some some of the same challenges and so forth. I mean, so it's a very sophisticated uh, program that loops all these things together um, in a pretty uh, innovative way. And the results are quite, you know, quite striking when you consider, uh, according to Kaiser Permanente, the spontaneous remission rate for diabetes is less than 1%. And you said around 50% currently is what you're getting as far as people who are either off of their medication entirely or those who are retreating or reversing? Yeah, we define reversal as um, hemoglobin A1C under 6.5. Got it. And uh, um, and off all diabetes medications except uh, metformin. Uh, so um, that is about one half. And we have very good engagement with our program, too. Uh, as you know, in most sort of dietary interventions or lifestyle intervention programs, uh, there's a high attrition rate. But uh, I believe we're just under... Uh, or actually maybe around 80% at one year and it's dropped just a little bit from there at two years. So we've had excellent uh, adherence. And, and that's really a big issue because, um, you know, at least uh, in my experience, um, there's a lot of people that are convinced the science is strong, and it is in, in diabetes especially, uh, but they still believe no one can stay on this diet, that it's uh, it's too difficult and too much of a sacrifice and a burden. Um, so that's the bigger issue a lot of people have, and uh, at least with our program, um, the data would suggest otherwise. Right. And I think that one of the things that you mentioned earlier is that it's very important for someone to work with their doctor if they're titrating back their medication. Can you just speak a little bit more on that? So if somebody is generally trying keto for the first time, they're feeling way better and they're just trying to play around their own medication, why that's not a good idea? Yeah. I mean, generally the ketogenic diet is very safe for most people, but if you're, um, if you're a uh, diabetic on insulin, um, you really do need to be very careful. Um, because I mean, the main risk is, uh, if you're, if you start a ketogenic diet, um, and continue on your same dosage of insulin, uh, you will very likely experience a pretty severe hypoglycemia, which can be very dangerous and life-threatening and land you in the emergency room. Uh, and so that's the real risk that uh, people need to understand. That if you're taking insulin uh, or sulfonylurea or any drug that's stimulating insulin, um, there is a, a need to adjust those medications quickly. Uh, this is not something that takes weeks or months. Um, it's, it's pretty much right away. Uh, so that has to be managed by a knowledgeable uh, physician who uh, you know, has experience with this. Uh, otherwise, it can be very dangerous. All right. So if someone's listening to this podcast and they, you know, they have diabetes, somebody they know has diabetes and they want to work with someone like this? Do you guys have open enrollment or how does that work? Or if not, do you have handouts that can take their doctors or resources? Uh, well, our primary business model is to work with large self-insured companies and insurance plans. Um, so uh, it, uh, the idea is you have a contract with a company and and then we, we get access to these employees and, 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 and enroll them into our program. Um, uh, but we also do a direct-to-consumer um, uh, sort of pathway as well. So um, that um, is available on the website. Um, there's a, a site there where you can request more information, and we, you know, we will accept um, you know out-of-pocket payments uh, to work with Verda as well. Um, so you have to kind of go through a series of questions and, and be screened, but that that's also a possibility. And is that something that you're looking to do to scale this to the 100 million people by 2027 is kind of make it direct access or is it more so working with large companies and just scaling that model? I think working with the insurance plans is, is the most efficient way to scale. Right, interesting. So, so I mean, what, what's next with Verda as far as the big milestones you guys are trying to reach in the next one, two, three years from, from a research standpoint? Uh, just, just signing more contracts and, and, and really um, 
you know, continuing to, to build the foundation so that, uh, you know, we can scale. Uh, the results are, you know, there's nothing else out there really that compares with this. Uh, so uh, it's just a matter of the floodgates are going to open and we need to be able to uh, to meet the need. And, and that's not trivial because, uh, you know, you don't want to lose the quality of the outcomes we're achieving now when you go 10x or 100x which is what we're talking about here. So there's a lot of attention on uh, on just tightening up everything we can and and making improvements to what we're doing and and building a very strong foundation uh, where we can uh, you know we can really scale effectively yeah. and keep great outcomes. Um, one of the things also I was, I was meaning to ask you and is as far as the individual aspect to it. Do you I mean how much do you guys focus on food quality or is it more so? start with macros to get them to a point and then eat, have them eat kind of more of a whole food, real food diet, or what is the emphasis you guys have there? I mean, is it one of the things that two, I mean, two things with research that sort of bug me with the ketogenic diet is one that people just say it's quote unquote low carb, therefore it's keto, or they feed them really awful quality foods, vegetable oils, things like that on a ketogenic diet and try to infer health outcomes of that. Um, so how, I mean, what is your approach to ameliorate that or on ramp people to getting high quality, healthy foods? Yeah, that's a really important question. And, and this is what's great about it. It, you know, we emphasize whole foods. Uh, we're not really peddling a lot of supplements, um, or fake foods. Uh, we're not a food company really. Um, this is, we're just teaching people how to clean out their cupboards and refrigerators and go to the store and buy different foods than they were before and and teaching them how to prepare those into really highly palatable and pleasurable meals. Um, uh, so there's a lot of principles to what we're doing because you're exactly right. It's more than just restricting carbs and elevating ketones. Um, you can induce ketosis a variety of different ways, but it's not going to be effective and completely side effect free and most important sustainable unless you understand all the components of a well formulated ketogenic diet and that gets into um, you know issues around getting protein in the right range the quality of fat understanding mineral balance uh, etc and this is what you know we teach people and it doesn't take a long time to um, to teach this, but what you have to understand is almost all of the components to a well-formulated ketogenic diet conflict with consensus, uh, you know, consensus um, sort of mainstream ideas now of what's healthy. So there are a lot of reasons people, despite their knowledge and, and really motivation to want to stay on this diet still fail. And that's where the um, ongoing support and, you know, access to health coaches is really important to make this stick long term. Uh, and, uh, and there's not a lot of people that really uh, are, uh, are promoting, you know, this idea of a well formulated ketogenic diet. Um, and, and, and so that's if you want to call it our secret sauce, <laughs> so to speak, um, none of it's proprietary, really. I mean, we've written about it in books and, and it's out there. Um, but there's a lot of people practicing ketogenic diets in a casual way. Right. They might get short term success, but a lot of those people, you know, really, really don't make it stick long term. Yeah. And I think like you said, there's just it's it's tough to go against the grain for so long. And a lot of people maybe get ostracized by their friends or family for making different choices or someone's cousin heard that, you know, eggs are still going to kill you. And so then the, now they can't have eggs and it comes off limit and then red meat is also terrible. And so, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of education. I think when people, especially when they're coming from a standard American diet and following, you know, following what the government told us to do. That's right. I mean, there are a lot of family and friends and even physicians and other healthcare professionals can sabotage the, the best efforts um, and the most motivated person. So, um, you know, those are things we help people navigate through all those challenges. All right. Well, yeah, love what you guys are doing over there. Um, anyway, people can support Verda, you know, if let's say they're not direct customers or anything like that. It's just to spread the word. Uh, yeah. Great question. I mean, we're a, 
I mean, I, this is out of my um, scope with the company, but you know, we're, we're 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 I think we're okay for now in terms of venture capital. So I won't you know pledge for money here. <laughs> um, Maybe do your research instead. But I, yeah, I appreciate you just giving me the opportunity to talk about Berta. We're, we're certainly, uh, you know, want to get the name out there and um, and make people aware of it and and uh, and promote it in a positive way. So that that I think um, alone is is very valuable to us. And as as far as what's next on your plate, pro, like for research and personal. Well, like I said, it, in terms of research, uh, I spend most of my day just on the hunt for money. And uh, writing grants and and trying to um, to keep the lab open and funded because the you know the type of work we do it's not cheap. I mean, um, you know you, you you can't do you'd be surprised um, you know with a million dollars it sounds like a lot of money and you can do some definitely some good work but um, even that um, is a pretty relatively small to moderate study. So that's the challenge is getting uh, the standard. Uh, you know, sort of federal sponsors out there to invest more money into this area because uh, that's the challenge. But, you know, I'm working hard in the areas of cancer and, and military applications, and so we're pumping out a lot of grants. Uh, I will say Ohio State's been great um, in terms of building multidisciplinary teams, and so we're working in the area of cancer and have great support from the oncologist here. And, and, you know, they just love the ketogenic diet. The patients come in and ask about it. And uh, so it's very much on their radar. Uh, one other area um, that I think is very promising is in congestive heart failure. So um, there's also a lot of uh, new evidence that the heart really prefers ketones over other substrates. And that when it's fueled by ketones, it's functioning better. And so um, it's it's would be naturally uh, logical to think a patient with congestive heart failure would benefit uh, from a ketogenic diet or potentially exogenous ketones. Right. So it's another area where uh, we're really um, getting some proposals out and trying to advance. Yeah, I mean concussions as well, like traumatic brain injuries, and a huge one. I mean, there's there's so many er- different areas that I'm so excited about in the next five, ten years. I think one one of my biggest fears is that. People just kind of fall off of it, and they they view it as a as a fad, and and then we just kind of have a movement away from that to something else. Um, I, that's kind of my biggest fear that we're trying to prevent day to day because day day. Um, yeah. I, I think it's so effective and it's such a great tool for so many different things, especially with the state of the state of our society and where we're at from a health outcome right now. So thank I, you. I I agree. Yeah. I I worry a little bit about that too, but um, I I think the genie's out now and. Yes, you're right. People still describe it. The critics describe it as a fad. It's going to go away. But I, you know, I don't know. Um, I think there's just too much science out there now. The mass of data is is too much to ignore. Although people are still trying to ignore it, uh, so I, I highly doubt it's going to go away. My my bigger concern is the science is just going to trickle forward rather than accelerate forward because there's still challenges in getting funding and just the sort of way research is done you know science is a slow process so uh, i'm kind of really motivated to figure out new ways to accelerate the pace of science and translation of that science uh, so we can take advantage of uh, of the benefits of this diet in different disease states or just for better functioning for everyone well you're, you're doing your part so thanks jeff um for being on the show besides people going to pubmed and and amazon and searching your name and getting all your materials there is there anywhere you would want to point them for for more information yeah i mean the, on the verta website we have uh, a blog that we try to get new content up every uh, week or two and so uh there's um, some really excellent information that um is being posted there uh so i kind of point people to that uh as a way to keep up on some of the relevant topics around ketones and nutritional ketosis right thanks again jeff appreciate it okay thank you anthony all right everyone thanks for listening to another episode of the keto answers podcast i hope you enjoyed it but even if you didn't i would love a review just go over to iTunes, wherever you listen to your podcasts and pop in a review so we can get found by more people, get better guests and have the information that you need. 
So please go to iTunes wherever you listen to your podcast and leave us a review. And if you're new to keto, head on over to perfectketo.com slash podcast and enter your email for all our top tips and guides on getting started with the ketogenic diet. Thanks and we'll see you next time.